we have one more type of probability to learn, and this is called the classical approach to probability. It's also called theoretical probability. And I will introduce it and this vocabulary with this example. So it says, Rita's going to watch a movie at random from her collection. She has four comedies, five action, and three dramas. Find the probability that she selects a drama from her collection. Okay, so a random experiment. So it says it's a chance process that leads to well-defined results called outcomes. So this would be Rita's experiment. She has how many movies here? Four plus five plus three. She's got 12 different movies. So we know one of those outcomes will happen. And the one she picks will be by chance because she's picking them randomly. Okay, the sample space, it says is for a random experiment, the sample space is the collection of all possible outcomes. So Rita's sample space would be the 12 movies that she has. So each one of those would be an outcome that is possible for selection. And then events are a set of outcomes. And in our case, we're gonna look at the probability she selects drama. So the event would be would consist of the three movies that are dramas. So we'll go through some notation here. So D is a drama is selected. Again, we use capital letters of the alphabet generally for events. And then this notation, N of S. So N is number of S is the sample space. So it's the number of items in the sample space. And in our case, again, it's 12, but I'll write the work here. So we have, she has four comedies, plus she has five action, she has three dramas. So the number of items in her sample space is 12. And then the number of those that are drama are three. So that notation again, it's just the number of movies that are drama. So the probability formula for theoretical probability, it's going to look similar um, to what we did with experimental probability, but just to change a bit of notation here. So for classical probability, each outcome needs to be equally likely, which it is for Rita, she's picking them at random. So the probability of an event, the probability of drama, it's the number of items in the event. So down here, it would be the number of items that are in the event, it's a drama. And then we divide it by the number of items that are in the sample space. So S for sample space. All right, so she has three dramas and there are 12 movies to choose from. So, I know this was pretty straightforward. The answer had to be three over 12, just focusing on notation here, which will help us as we move forward. And then again, as always, we could do fractions, we can do decimals, we can do percents. So we won't keep doing every version, but I'll go ahead and just write down decimal is 0.25. There's a 25% chance she would select at random a movie that's a drama. Okay, so for the next one, I'm not even going to write the formula. We're just kind of kind of discuss it. Sometimes I think the formulas actually get in our way. And with probability, it's good to just sort of think about the logic of it sometimes. So let me do this probability question. We've got an aquarium with 16 large fish, four small fish, and half of those large fish are red. We're going to pick a fish at random and find the probability that we get a fish that is a large red fish. All right, so just reviewing the and intersection notation from earlier, we'd be looking for the probability it's a large fish and it also satis satisfies the criteria being a red fish. So it has to be a large fish and it also needs to be a red fish. All right, so I often like to just do my denominators first because the denominator is always the total outcomes in our sample space. So it's basically how many fish are in this aquarium that are possibly going to be selected. So I'm just going to write the N up here, the number of items in our sample space. So we've got 16 large fish, we've got four small fish, so we've got 20 fish that are possible. So that's my denominator, the number of fish in that aquarium. And then the numerator would be the number of them that meet this um, event definition of being large and also being red. So 16 are large, and of those 16, half of those large fish are red. 
So half of 16 would be eight fish. So eight fish meet the condition of being a large red fish. And that's it. So you don't have to reduce fractions. You can if you want. And we could do decimal or percent. Just follow directions on how they would like you to write your answer. But we'll just leave that one as it is. OK. So let's move on to, um, we often talk about classical probability with things like spinning a spinner or rolling dice or playing cards. These are all kind of classic examples of classical probability. So the idea here is I've got a region with six slices and they're different colors and we're gonna spin the spinner and it will fall on one of these slices at random. So because the slices are equally sized, that means each one of the slices is equally likely. So that's when we're allowed to do this classical probability approach. So we start by saying, what are the number of items in our sample space? So what are the number of possibilities when we spin the spinner? And it has six regions, so that would be six. I'm just adding the word regions for emphasis. So that's just counting how many regions are possible. So then we're gonna go through the probability of landing on each of these particular colors. So now I know my denominator is the six. So I'm just gonna put my six down there. So the probability of landing on blue, out of those six possibilities, two of those regions are blue, so two out of six. And then red, we've got one region out of six that is red. And yellow, we've got three regions out of the six that are yellow. And you'll notice here, one reason I did not want to reduce these fractions is because we will often talk about adding up all those probabilities together. And we know when we add fractions, we need a common denominator. So we've got the six. And then when you add the numerators, two plus one plus three, that better be six because we just accounted for everything that could happen. You're gonna to have to land on blue, red, or yellow. So there's a one chance, which in percent, there's a 100% chance that you're gonna land on either blue, red, or yellow. All right, so that's a spinner type question. And then we're gonna go on to rolling a die. So we're just gonna roll a single die, got a single die down here. And we're gonna roll a six-sided die for this example, but a die can have um, 12 sides, 20 sides. There's different types of dice, but we're gonna do a six-sided die. And you may hear it referred to um, on Alex as a number cube. So a number cube is just a die. So singular of dice is die, just writing there. So that's one die. And fair means that every side is equally likely. So I wrote a sample space here, S. So if you roll a six-sided die, you're either gonna land on one, two, three, four, five, or six, and each of those outcomes is equally likely. That's what fair means. All right, so I'm gonna do a little bit of circling. So classical probability is about counting outcomes. So if we're interested in the probability of rolling a four, so there's a four. So out of the six outcomes, there's only one outcome that's actually rolling a four. So one outcome out of six gives us our probability of rolling a four. So again, I'm not writing the formula again here. I will go back to that in a bit, but just kind of talking it through, um, I think is easier in some cases like this. So for B, the probability you do not roll a four, so not rolling a four would be everything that's not a four. So it would be those five values, one, two, three, five, six. So five of those values out of the six. All right, and then just notice together, if I take the chance of rolling a four with the chance of not rolling a four, those two together are going to add up to six over six or one again. So you're either going to have to roll a four or not roll a four. And we'll talk more about um, that sort of concept later. Um, these are called complements of one another. And we'll, ref we'll return to complements in a bit. Okay, let's do another one. The probability of rolling at least a four. So at least a four means four or more. So you need to make sure you're good with that phrase, at least. So at least a value four or more. 
Another way to say it is at least four means no less than four. So it has to be a four, a five, or a six. So there's three outcomes out of six that make up that event. And then we're gonna to return to this idea, this idea of unions and intersections. So I'm actually gonna do these two together now. Let me start with union. So union means the combining of the sets or the joining of the sets. So union is gonna be the word or. So this means let's circle all of the numbers greater than four. So that would be five, six. And then when I see or, I like to say the phrase along with, because we're gonna also include the values that represent the other event. So I've got my numbers greater than four, and let's also circle values that are less than three. So less than three would be one and two. So we take all of those values for outcomes, along with all of the values that meet the other condition requirement, and together that would be four out of the six outcomes. So or means count include any number greater than four and also include, so along with, join with the set of all the numbers that are less than three. All right, so let's contrast that with intersection for the same problem. Now for intersection, I'm gonna show a little more work here because intersection is the word and, and this means we're gonna look for outcomes that are common to both of these groups. So I just like to write down those numbers greater than four. That was five, six. Oops, I said five, six and wrote four, six. So greater than four would be a five or a six. And numbers less than three would be a one or a two. So when we say, what's the probability a number is greater than four and less than three? In probability, and means numbers that meet both criteria. So you have to satisfy both criteria. And I see that this group, five, six, has nothing in common with this group, one, two. They share nothing. So they share no outcomes. So there is, there is no way to get a number out of these six. There is no way a number can be both these things at the same time. So you can't be greater than four and also be less than three. So sometimes students think and means take all of these numbers and all of those. And that's actually the definition of or. So or is combining the two groups and is only counting values that the two groups have in common. All right, and I keep saying groups, um, but this event. So this event and that event share nothing, nothing in common. All right, so zero out of six, of course, is zero. So there's no possibility there. All right, let's try another one here. So let's do another or and example. So the probability of getting a number greater than two, and this is an or question, so I know I'm gonna include any numbers greater than two. So three, four, five, six. And I'm also going to include, so along with any numbers that meet this condition of being odd. So we almost have all the odds. We still need to circle the one. So those numbers that I've circled are either greater than two, or they are odd. Some of them happen to be both, but or just means union, take everybody that meets one condition or the other. So five of those outcomes out of six meet one condition or the other, or possibly both. All right, and then and. All right, I'm gonna separate these again. So for and, because I'm doing intersection, first, let me just write down the numbers greater than two. So three, four, five, six. And then this condition, odd. So odd numbers are one, three, five. And then we're looking for numbers that satisfy both of these conditions. So part of both of these events. So I can see three meets both criteria. Five meets both criteria. I think that's it. So three satisfies both criteria and five does as well. So three is greater than two and is also an odd number. And then we also have the five that meets both conditions. So two out of those six numbers satisfy both conditions. So for and, I think of the word both, it must meet both conditions. And for or, union, I think along with. So everybody joining the, these two events together. 
All right. And then we're going to do one last thing here, combining the two approaches we've learned, theoretical probability that we just covered and experimental probability, which we did earlier, and sort of see how these are related. And I'll talk about this law in just a moment. So I'm going to go back to my spinner. A dial has six equally sliced regions. Again, we've got the different colors. And then it says we actually spin the dial. So this is an experiment and it's like it lands on a slice at random and we're going to spin the dial actually 10 times. Um, these are called trials. So we perform this experiment 10 trials, 10 times, and these were the results we got. So when you're actually doing the experiment, these are experimental results. So if a question is asking experimental probability, you're actually looking at what happened when you spun the dial. So I'm just going to write above my table here. This is your experiment. So I kind of want to just do part B first. So let's return to experimental. So we want to know the probability of landing on yellow. And we know nothing about, just pretend you know nothing about the spinner. All you know is somebody did an experiment and this is what happened on their results. So you can see two red, eight yellow, and no blue. So if I add up all of those things that occurred, I've got a total of 10 spins. So it said that's why we have the 10 spins of the dial. And experimentally then, this formula was frequency over N. So when we do an experiment, we count how many times the event yellow happened, eight times, out of N, the total number of observations or trials was 10. And I'm going to go ahead and put that in decimal. That'll be 0.8. So based on this experiment, all I can tell people is, based on my experiment, there's an 80% chance that the spinner will land on yellow. OK, you're going to see now that does not match what happens in theory. So let's talk about theoretically what we should expect to happen. So theoretically means we're not looking at your experiment, we're actually looking at the spinner itself to see what we expect to happen. So that's why I say look at the spinner. So the probability of yellow, and I'm gonna go back to the formula for theoretical probability. So we said it's the number of, in this case, yellow. So the number of outcomes in the event we're interested in and we divide by the number of items in our sample space. So the sample space, so the sample space again is just every outcome that could possibly happen. So in our sample space, we have six outcomes, right? So any one of those six regions could happen. So my denominator over here, I know that one of those six things will happen and the chances of getting yellow. So we need to know the number of those six that are yellow regions and three of them are yellow. So in theory, right, three over six is half of those regions, 0.5 or a 50% chance. So looking at the spinner in theory, this makes sense. Half of the regions are yellow. Should I, I so I should expect to land on yellow half the time. But when we did our experiment, we landed on yellow 80% of the time. Okay, so here's the deal with this thing called the law of large numbers. If we want our experimental probability to start matching what would happen theoretically, we really can't just spin a spinner 10 times. So the law of large numbers says that we really have to perform our experiment a lot, a large number of times. And we don't quite define the word large. So when I say large, do I mean a thousand times, a million times? It just means that the more times I spin it, the greater the likelihood that your experiment will match what we know is true in theory. So I know we didn't get 50% yellow in the experiment, but if we did spin that spinner a thousand times, I would expect half of them about 500 times to be landing on yellow. Okay, so 
let's try another one. So in this case, you're seeing I'm writing the formulas because I need to make sure you see the difference between theoretical probability and experimental probability. All right. So let's try this one with lottery, the lottery example. All right, so we've got a lottery board that is randomly picking lottery numbers. And on every trial, so when they pick a number, so what they do, you might picture like, I don't know, the old machines with ping pong balls that randomly spit out a ping pong ball with a number on it. So they randomly pick numbers, so a ball, and these balls are labeled with digits zero through nine. So here's the balls that are labeled. So those are my outcomes. And I'm just gonna make a note here on the side. So a digit, so a digit is a single column number. So a digit, that's why the digits are zero through nine. So in total, how many digits are there? So if you count digits zero, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there's 10 possibilities that makes up the number zero through nine. So the number of items in the sample space. So what could happen in theory is you can get any one of those 10 outcomes. So number of items in our sample space. All right, and then I'll just add the word outcomes here just because. So we've got 10 outcomes possible. All right, so this is what could happen. And then the lottery board is gonna test their machine. So the idea is they want to have these numbers picked randomly. So they're trying to kind of check if their machine is functioning properly and isn't throwing out the number six too often or the number two too often. They're hoping that their machine is there and selects a digit so that each one of these values is equally likely. So they're gonna do a trial run, um, 200 trials actually, they're gonna test the machine. So they tested it, 200 trials. So if you add up all these different trial numbers, that will be 200, you can check it, but it will be. So that's 200 trials that they did. And then I can see that 12 times the machine chose a zero, 19 times the machine chose a ball with a one on it. 20 times the ball had a two on it, et cetera. So we are going to compute based on the experiment, the probability of getting an even number. So experimental always means we're looking at the results of the experiment. So the probability, we'll just do E for even. So experimental is frequency over N. All right, so this is what I observed. How many times did we end up with an even number? So sometimes students will ask me, is zero even or odd? And zero is even. So I'm just gonna do a little E there. Zero is even, of course, two is even, four is even, six is even, eight is even. And how many times did the machine pick an even number? So, I'll even write out each one here. So we got a zero 12 times. We got a two 20 times. We got a four 24 times. We got a six 18 times. And we got an eight 15 times. So those are all the times we got even numbers out of 200 trials of this experiment. All right, so let me add those guys up. So 12 plus 20 plus 24 plus 18 plus 15 is 89 times that machine picked an even number out of 200 trials of the experiment. All right, it's gonna be helpful for me to write that in decimal here. So I'm gonna divide that. And that's 0 0.445. So we'll do the decimal first. And I'm also going to just talk that as a percent. So when they tested the machine, they got an even number 44.5% of the time. That is a little hard to read. I'm just going to try that one more time. So 0 0.445. 
So 44.5% of the time, the experiment resulted in an even number. Okay, that's what literally happened experimentally. So then it says, if the machine is actually fair, so fair means each of these outcomes should be equally likely, then in theory, what is the probability of getting an even number? Okay, so it's the number of even numbers over the number of items in the sample space. So theoretically, we're looking at, I'm going to do my denominator. Theoretically, I know that we can choose any one of these 10 even numbers. So the machine is going to pick any one of those 10 even numbers. And of those 10 outcomes that are possible, how many of them are even numbers? So one, two, three, four, five. So there are five even numbers. So that's why the number of even numbers, five out of 10 possibilities. So just purely looking at what could happen and that will show us that if the lottery machine is fair, that's going to be 0.5. I should expect half the time, 50% of the time, I should get an even number, which would mean 50% of the time I should get an odd number. So odd and even should be equally likely. Now, when they ran their experiment, they did not get 50%, they got 44.5%. So this last part is about the law of large numbers. So the idea again is the more you test the machine, so instead of 200 times, what if they instead did 2000 trials? So the more times you perform your experiment, the more likely it is that your experiment will match the theory. So assuming that the machine is indeed fair, the larger the number of trials, the larger the likelihood, so you're gonna have a bigger chance, the larger the likelihood that the experimental probability will be close to the theoretical probability. All right, so that's our last question here, sort of tying these two types of probability together.